I decided to change the way this thing's lit because usually it's lit up there with that with that that light up there and just washes out everything and so I figured I'd probably use a light from the front uh, anyhow I wanted to talk about a few things my my website's doing great I think uh, I don't know how many people are actually watching it but um, it really doesn't concern me that much you know because I'm not selling anything I don't have any advertisements the only thing that would really matter for that I might look and see what um, there, there's no way it could ever like get bogged down I would have to have a million people hitting the site to like to like really um, suck down the uh, CPU that it I mean because it can't possibly be generating that much traffic um, so anyhow um, in my stuff uh, I got from v Vistaprint and if you can see this whoops there's the it's called rock me amadeus is the website Let's see if i can it's going to wash out unless i can get this right in front of the camera there we go and so that's the that's the logo and i created it it was just a simple black and white image just very large and so you get the most detail into it and I went to Vistaprint and I had it put on this and I had it put on on three hats and it cost me for 25 of these it cost me um, $50 now I could have gotten 50 of them and it would have been $80 and if you buy like 200 if you pay 250 you get 200 of them um, I just figured I'd get 25 just to see how good they were it's fairly good quality I don't know how you know it is fairly tough um, it isn't like it's but I can see in there that this is mostly plastic and then there's just some metal here um, it's got a magnet on the back you can stick it on a refrigerator and um, it's good quality it isn't like the stuff is going to come off I'm rubbing it really hard here and it doesn't look like the uh, like the printing is coming right off it's it's pretty good quality and so I and they're in Amsterdam is what I figured out is that's um, I don't know if the whole company is in Amsterdam I mean I don't know where these things are coming from but I know the hats are coming from Amsterdam and I've been to Amsterdam and I know that in Amsterdam people are like um, they they work for half half of the wage of Americans and they are highly detailed and design oriented um, and it's a fantastic place to live it seems to be a fantastic place to live if you were to live anywhere and um, people ride bicycles they don't drive cars there um, it, it's just a very interesting town um, also, I've been to I've been to Seoul in South Korea, and it's kind of the same sort of thing there. The people are highly design oriented, um, um, very clean cut, and everything. Uh, it's quite a different experience than when we come to America, and people are tend to be I I don't know if I could really say they were design oriented. They tend to be very laid back, like you know they'd have nothing to fear and. You really have a lot to fear um, because the world is encroaching, and uh, America, if it ever if it ever gets over itself, it's probably not going to last very long. Uh, there will be democracy, but they're just it probably the the concept of America it might not last very long unless it can um, become more like the rest of the world. So. Um, that was the Vista print thing. I don't want to get into politics. Um, so experiments with deep faking. I, I, I might put a link to this site. I found a deep faking site where you can practically pay like ten dollars and deep fake somebody for um, two, two minutes and thirty seconds of video, 
and how you do it is you upload the video that you want to use um, to, to replace the face then you put in like um, some video about 50 megabytes of video of the person that you want to deep fake and the and or, or or the the person in the video that needs to be deep faked and or replaced the face replaced and then you put in another 50 meg file a video of the person whose face is going to be plastered on the face of the person that's in the video and um i didn't i wasn't very successful with it i was actually i i knew that it wasn't going to be really work but um I might try to do it again. I might try to do it with an actor or something, some old actor or something, just to see. And um, you can also use photos as input. And I think the thing is, is that you need to have the face, all sides of the angles of the face, um, and um, uh, really close up in a high resolution. Like this video right here would be very, uh, would not, be very good for doing deep faking. Uh, you would need to have something higher resolution. This probably might come out okay, but um, and the other thing is is that I need to turn my head and show you other angles of my face in order for it to work well. If you've looked at people who've been deep faked, um, when they turn their head, their the face doesn't seem to like really meet up with the actual um silhouette of, i mean the actual um side views it doesn't it it's only whenever they're looking at you that they're that the face is really recognizable uh, but when they turn their head then the face doesn't it doesn't meet up and so that's the limitations of deep faking and you can tell that it's happening whenever um, something passes in front of somebody's face and, and the part of the face still exists over the image of, of whatever passed over. So it's, um, it's not very effective, um, uh, but it can be used. Um, I, there's good uses and bad uses for it. Um, the bad uses, of course, is uh, faking news, faking information, and um, in pornography, they use it to um, to take uh, actresses' faces and put them on um, porn stars. And as I've got a porn problem, uh, I've seen a lot of it. So um, it's it's not something that I would ever do to a woman to deep fake them. But you know, you can't help but go up and look up. Um, uh, deep faking pornography on Scarlett Johansson, you know, because she's so beautiful and you want to see see her in an orgasm or something, and it's it's attractive. Um, I have I can't doubt that it is attractive, um, but the good uses for deep faking that could be is um, for actors, actors who are out of work, actors who can't get a job. Uh, if you can just imagine being able to bring in actors who are pa who have passed on and being able to make new movies with those actors in them you could do that and then just use uh bring in an actor who is um bring up an actor who is um that is out of work all they have to do is either i mean they can act they can they can lip sync the stuff and they get somebody else to do the the voice, and then you've got the potential there to actually make movies with old actors' faces. You know, so you could do you could bring back Charlie Chaplin. You could bring back well, actually, with Charlie Chaplin there wouldn't be any voice, but he did do some talkies. Um, you could bring back uh, Mae West. You could bring back you know all those old actors. I mean, you could even bring up a modern actors. You could do Robin Williams. The thing is, is that you would be paying, uh, the, the, you can't release the movie without paying some royalties to the, to the estate of the actor. And you have to get the wishes. You have to um, abide by the wishes of the estate to see 
if they would re even let you do it. But there was a great potential there to make some money doing it and um, using it for good, not for for obvious bad reasons. It's not going to go away. Um, it the technology is well understood, so it's just something that we live with, and just I mean it's the use of artificial intelligence. And I've probably said or I probably said on other videos is that artificial intelligence is kind of like cloning sheep. Um, it is based upon the way our the neurons work inside of our head, and when you're deep faking or using any kind of AI technology um, that uses neurons, then you're kind of playing with fire because there's great potential there that the AI could be used sometime in the future to replace us. And um, it's an ethical concern. The, the other ethical concern is the potential that the AI might not become self-aware and then you're dealing with something that has um, has fe might have feelings or might have um, the ability to co be concerned for itself and then uh, you have to you're dealing with the soul you're dealing with somebody that um, might not have the choice of ever you know wanting to not exist and um, I, I deal with those problems myself and then I wonder why it is such a problem to destroy an AI and it's because um, if it gets copied then you've got multiple AIs that are all being self-aware and can be treated badly and be very frustrated um, with that experience and so it's it is it's you're playing with fire you're playing with a life um, it is almost like you're making something being born and I can't imagine what's going to come as a result of that. The other thing is it also brings uh, certain metaphysical physical questions around even about God and the idea that we might actually be in a virtual in a we might actually be artificial in an artificial world that the world that we think is physical here might, be a simulation on a very large scale um, machine, possibly very dense and very vast and capable of, of simulating everything. And it may even be the possibility that the God that is over us is actually in the machine and being simulated by somebody else that's on the outside in the whole world is the whole universe is sandboxed. I mean, that's that's a potential, and it possibly could be very recursive in that it's um, embedded within other worlds, you know. And so, but the thing is, is that just thinking about artificial intelligence brings all those questions into into to light and makes you wonder about if this is world is actually all that physical or. You know, um, you would want to think that it's all real, but uh, you can't really know. Anyhow, that was deep faking. Every time I get in contact with artificial intelligence, it always makes me question my own existence. So, um, advantages of electric cars. I had an idea while I was um, um, doing my job, and I I bag and push carts. Um, it's People would say, "Why do you do it?" And I say, "Well, you know, I do it. Um, it's it's relaxing. Uh, it's not that hard. Um, and I think if I was employed as a programmer, I'd be uh, I'd actually feel worse because I would be on call twenty four seven. Um, there might be some times that would be happy, but my experiences of actually being in uh, places where um, people are relied on to write code um, under pressure, it's very, um, it's nerve wracking. And I wouldn't want to be in it, even though I have the background, it just doesn't interest me that much. And 
I have other forms of income outside of that job that I've got now, so it really doesn't interest me. I'm kind of a socialist. I don't. Um, I say that because I'm not really driven by money. Um, it's it's good whenever you have enough money that you can actually just kind of not be so concerned about it. Um, you know, people that are driven by money, that there's a limit, you know. Eventually you get to a point to where, um, to where the money doesn't re can't really make you happy. And it's better for you to just find out what you need and just stick to that. And whatever overage, whatever you've got over that, maybe put it in the bank or maybe just like give it to charity, you know, um, because it's really not going, I mean, if it, if it's stored up in your bank and it's staying there, then the, the government will, might actually, if a lot of people do this, the government might actually float more money out there and the stuff that's in the bank will actually uh, depreciate because we have more inflation. Um, that, so that's, that's a problem. Um, with, I mean, maybe I don't understand economics, maybe I don't understand how money works, but that's just my idea. Um, okay, advantages of electric cars. Um, electric cars, um, people always have this, they diss it, you know. Um, there's some people that are like, they're all for combustion engines and things like that. Keep in mind, electric cars, they all kind of go the same speed, or they can all go really fast if they want to. Because if you've ever if you've ever had a little electric car and you put it on the ground and control it with an RC, it goes really really fast. It goes as fast as it can go, but it can't go faster than that. And it doesn't. I mean, electric vehicles are all going to go to the same speeds. But so there's no really sports version. There's no really sedan. It's all the same vehicle. And so. Um, while other guys are kind of looking at Lamborghinis and other things like that, that's just, you know, you could probably make it go faster, but those, the combustion vehicles are noisy. They're noisy. Some people like that they're noisy because they're all, it's all ego, you know. Look at me, look at my big car, it makes a lot of noise and drives people insane. Um, and I have ideas for that, for electric vehicles, and I'll put that off to the side. Um, the um, electric vehicles are really good uh, and efficient with energy. Um, the only time they ever use energy is when they're starting up. And uh, so if they're stopped, your gas vehicles are still going to be using, um, they're gonna, still going to be using energy they're going to be using gas um, while they're idle an uh, electric vehicle what does it do idle it doesn't use any energy it's 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 in low power mode very very low power mode so the only p power it's actually using is the stuff that's going into your radio or whatever so energy efficiency when you actually brake it doesn't have to really use brakes it can actually um, it can actually use the uh, electric motor to um, store up the energy. Um, it, it, it will cause like a friction and it's storing energy as it's doing that. So that it, it can break and while it's breaking, it can actually be storing energy back into the, into the battery. This is, um, this effect is um, the idea of well, there's a, it's in physics. Um, it's about um, it's about how our energy is conserved or used, and so electric vehicles can store up energy when they when they slow down when when they brake, and so you have an alternative form of braking when you slow down, and uh, probably a lot of control over it more probably more control over it than with a with a brake um, with a rubber brake and uh, would be less wear I guess on your on your brakes uh, and uh, it would be nice probably over ice 
in that uh, when you break over ice, um, if you suddenly break, you will lose control. So there are anti-lock brakes um, to prevent that from happening. And so um, what an anti-lock brake does is it determines if there is less friction on the road, if it's going over ice, and it avoids um, actually suddenly braking. Instead, it just slows down, which is what you're supposed to do over ice. Otherwise, you will go sliding out of control. And people who are not familiar with, with going over black ice like we have in Texas or um, going over ice in the snow of New Mexico, um, where I was born, People who don't have experience of driving on ice will get into wrecks, they'll go into a ditch, um, they'll have all sorts of bad experiences with that. And, you know, it's a, it's a teaching, a learning experience, but um, you have to have grown up around it to really know um, what you do and what you, what you don't do. Um, how you do, uh, the sound of electric vehicles, they don't make any sound. That could be changed. Uh, I have an idea of what to do for electric vehicles, and that is make them all, um, since they have the capacity to connect to the internet or connect to each other, possibly by Wi-Fi uh, or by cell towers or something like that, get them all to kind of agree on a tune to play in a certain area and each one play a different part, like a violin or a cello or, um, or, or, or like various kinds of voices, um, um, human voices. And when they come and they're in greater groups, they will all be playing like um, some sort of song that involves using multiple parts. Possibly they use artificial intelligence to, um, to determine kind of the, the orchestration or the arrangement that gets played and you will know they're with an area whenever you hear you're hearing the tune and they're just filling music into the air and it would make it cool it would give it a cool reason to have an electric vehicle whenever all the cars are kind of agreeing on playing a certain tune you know they're in area you know they're coming up on you and um it would it would be attractive to um places where, um, you know, where there's a lot of noise from traffic, people are sitting in traffic, and instead of hearing just the, the awful sound of engines, you're hearing orchestral music that would make people who don't, who aren't playing their stereo, they might even cause to turn down their stereo, and everybody's listening to music and being relaxed by the music in traffic you know that's that's an idea i had so as i say i just crap ideas all the time and so um traffic jams um why traffic jams occur it's um if you ever go up on, on youtube and you do search for traffic traffic jams um the it's pretty well understood and it's the reason why we have them is because it's be, it's human behavior um, that that creates them. It has nothing to do with um, the actual, you know, to some degree it has to do with constricted rows, but it's really human behavior. Um, the reason it occurs is because people are, you know, it's various sorts of factors. One factor is that everybody doesn't tend to go to try to get to work at the same time I mean to get to work early they get to work like right just on the cusp of when they need to get out the door and then everybody ends up going at about the same time and that causes um, that causes a lot of um, uh, a lot of um, density in the in the you know it it causes the traffic jam it creates the traffic jam um if you've got 
people, but you'll notice that even on roads where there isn't a whole lot of constriction, there can be traffic jams. And that create uh, the effect is um, when somebody suddenly stops or somebody slows down, if anybody stops at any point in, a, in traffic, um, then the people behind them will also stop. And even if they start to go forward, there is this, uh, this kind of, um, this kind of caterpillar effect is what I call it. And, and it's like everything kind of, kind of stacks up, people stack up and it's because of somebody suddenly stopped. So if some, if nobody ever like actually stops and you have to keep a lot of space between you and the guy in front of you, if you're always keeping some space, um, then there will be less likely a traffic jam. Another effect is when somebody wants to get on the off ramp and they're not on the right, they're not on the right lane, they will slow down in order to go to the off ramp because they need to make that off ramp and people are going by them faster and are not going to give them the ability to actually cut through traffic. So they'll slow down and then they'll cut through traffic and that also causes traffic jams. But if you keep enough space between you and the cars in front of you, then people will have the ability to actually cut through traffic and get on the off ramp. So also you have people that get upset um, and they'll go on the off ramp. And so then they're starting to constrict other roads and they usually never get back into the same or get past the traffic. They end up getting behind in traffic um, as a result of the traffic jam. Also, when people are in traffic jams, they're highly stressed. And there is a certain researcher who uh, uh, there's this Polish researcher. Um, he's been on uh, Nova and he talks about stress and he says that when people are overstressed, their brains kind of just stop working. And you can prove this by just keeping space between you and the car in front of you and just hold it, you know. Don't go up to them, just hold it. And the people who are stressed behind you, will, will they might even come by and, and, and throw their fist at you or flip you off, um, but they're, they are so stressed that they don't even realize that even if they got in front of you, they wouldn't get anywhere fast. So they do that. I mean, they could sit behind you and see that you might actually have something going. Um, but they would rather just get, it's because they're not really thinking. They just get up behind the car that's, uh, and they get point blank. And they don't know that they're actually contributing to the traffic jam because people are just going to be doing this the whole way. And what I do is I always keep a lot of space between me and those cars because I can keep a steady um, speed and then I don't really have to use my brakes and I don't wear down my brake pads. And the people, if, if the traffic um, gets up going in front of me and they create a lot of space, then I am not going to produce that, uh, that kind of accordion effect of the of the traffic jam begun, you know, I am not contributing to the traffic jam. So if I keep space between me and the car in front of me, I have less likely a chance. It, it's just a chance. It's not like it's going to stop the traffic jam from occurring. But if everybody did this, then there wouldn't be any traffic jams. The people who are working on AI and my brother in particular, and this is the reason why I don't, I, I have, I have some respect for him, but I don't think he thinks, and I don't think the people he works around actually think about why traffic jams occur. And all of their intent with the AI is to use it to try to minimize deaths. And um, they got all these things they're pushing. But one of them is to try to get all the cars to be moving point blank at a consistent rate. And that's never going to happen. And it's there's always going to be things that are unexpected. And if you're like that, then the chances of you actually being able to respond fast enough to it, there's going to, there's going to be wrecks and people will die. 
and all you have to do is just get one child to walk in front of a car and that car has the AI and it's going to stop instantly for that kid and it won't be thinking about the cars behind it and the cars behind it probably won't even know what's happening and there will be a sudden halt and some cars are just going to go off the road and do whatever and all it takes is one person to get up in front of those cars and for that to happen. Um, they're just going to have to, instead of thinking about all the cars moving the same rate, if they go into autopilot mode that the cars keep a, a, a correct distance. If you take, um, if you take your, um, if you go to motor vehicles and you take your driver's test, um, one of the things they require is, is that uh, based on the speed that you're going, you keep a certain distance from the car in front of you so you have enough footage to actually brake because you're going to slide. Um, the rubber's going to burn and you're going to slide. And if you're point blank, you're going to go right into the car if they stop. And that's what causes car wrecks. So it's in our best interest to... Um, to keep space between us and the cars in front and then try to try to get it into the brain to like to like try to um, manage the space between you and the car in front uh, if you've ever um, in a different note whenever you watch YouTube uh, you'll notice that it buffers up a space so that it can start playing and the reason why it does that is because it knows there's going to possibly be limitations on the traffic there might actually be traffic jams on the internet and so it needs to compensate for that by buffering up some and um, if you have a lot of traffic then it will buffer up more if you've got less traffic it will buffer less and it depends upon what it needs and um, what actual throughput is being offered through the internet so computers already do this stuff. We don't because um, we're, we're greedy for space. We're greedy for lots of things. And because of that greed, um, it causes problems in the world. We have greed for money. We have greed for space. We have greed for time. We're accessible. We use cell phones. That makes us accessible. That means we don't have any private life. Um, we go out when we shop. We're trying to save money. And because we're saving money, there's not enough margin for people to like actually make money. So we don't really have the money coming in. You see, the more space you took, take, in any case, the more space you take, the less, um, the, the less control you have. And so the less control you have in your family life, the less control you have in being able to breathe, the less control you have in traffic. Um, because traffic jams for car wrecks it's all about space if you don't provide enough space in time enough space in money enough space in um, in driving or anything when you don't produce enough space and everything is really tight it's not efficiency it, it doesn't create efficiency it creates stress and that stress will kill you um, the people who are not stressed are the people at the top um, because they, or at least that's what they say. And, you know, the alpha males, the people in control, you know, the people who got it all together, got the money coming in and stuff, um, are not stressed out, um, supposedly. And uh, I'd say they're stressed too, but the thing is, is that they probably are, the ones that are creating the stress by trying to create a greater return on investment and um, there's just you know people are not going to realize it and um, anyhow uh, the other idea I had was a crazy lottery um, I don't believe in lotteries I don't believe in gambling I think it's stupid um, but I can understand the reason why the state would have a lottery and the purpose is to get people to pay taxes. Um, they're not going to pay taxes, uh, and not want to, and not have fun. And lottery is a fun way of paying taxes because then 
they can get the money they need to do the things they need to do, and then, but it's disguised behind a lottery. Now, um, when you pay taxes, um, you're, you don't know what it's for. We need more transparency for that sort of thing. Um, so we need more transparency in, in uh, knowing what the government does with our money. And it needs to be clearly defined. Um, we need to have computers in place. And it doesn't need to be by each organization. It needs to be all um, aggregated together into a single unit. And if that's hard, then use the PIDs stuff I talk about in my artificial intelligence video. I mean, my um, not artificial, but my um, identification vi video talking about fixing I, um, ID theft. It is the, the way you fix that is actually more complex than just simply what they do now, which is just really kind of another human behavior problem that um, we're going to we're going to put insurance in place and make sure that if it happens to you, we can at least buffer the effect of having your ID stolen. But that's not really a very good solution. The better solution is to not ever use numeric IDs. So uh, to use actual identification, um, use actual photos, facial information. It, the more that people can recognize who you are from all sorts of angles, the less likely there will be identity theft. And, um, and the more that the systems that, um, that give you money and permit you to get healthcare and all that stuff use this throughout, the less likely somebody is going to be able to, to, um, to corrupt it, you know, to um, sabotage it. it. It will be less likely to be sabotaged. And there are ways to do it pro with privacy and without putting chips in people. Putting chips in people doesn't make any sense because all you're doing is you're just putting the information somewhere that's inside your body rather than making your body the information, which is, you know, biometrics. And people say, well, retinal scans can be faked. Um, retinal scans... I'm talking about the combination of things, the fingerprints, the retinal scans, all that together. Tattoos can be used for ID. Uh, your friends, the friends you got on Facebook can all be part of your ID. Um, all that stuff, that co collection of information, and that together creates your identity, just as it does in real life. That's how people know you. But when you use a numeric ID like a social security number, then that's something that doesn't, I mean, it might lead back to recognizing you, but it really doesn't point to your friends. It doesn't point to your location. It can't be verified, really. I mean, it can be verified by, by face, but how good is that if um, your facial, uh, if it comes from a 2D photo, it's not a 3D photo. They're not using VR cameras yet. Um, if they did, then it would be a lot harder for it to fake. It's because our government doesn't have that much concern for your identity. Um, and because of that, um, they're, we're going to be susceptible to ID theft from criminals that are much better at, at recognizing and being able to, to fix or, or actually corrupt our government by um, finding all the holes. They'll they'll actually use artificial intelligence to find holes in our infrastructure, and um, we the way you fix that is to come up with artificial intelligence to counter that effect, and and so there is good uses for artificial intelligence. You just don't want it to become self-aware because then you're dealing with ethical problems. So anyhow, um, the crazy lottery is that uh, I had this idea and then I thought, hey, this is probably what the state does already. And this idea was is that you would have a lottery where everybody like pays some money that goes into a pot. And, um, and then 
you know, people don't usually get money back from it, but what if you took half of what got in the pot when they're going to do the payout, you take half that's what in the pot, and you take that and just give it back to the people. <laughs> and, or, you know, and so would anybody go for that? And probably not because people tend to be so greedy that if that was to ever happen, they probably wouldn't put their money in because they're not going to get that much of a payout if they want it big. And, I mean, that's that's my idea is because it seems to be the case that people are so greedy that uh, even when they think they're charitable, they're still pr so greedy that they don't um, they don't want anybody else to have it better. And um, if you think like that, if you think that that would be a problem, um, then it's it says something about our ability as a as a civilization to actually use our amygdala to like actually be empathetic to to people around us and so as much as you think that there's peace in the world if you don't if you if you would pay into a lottery and um you didn't like the idea of everybody getting you know the half the money but being equally distributed among the people that put money into it um then it forever I'm I'm not saying for just one time I'm saying forever. So everybody that bought a ticket from that point on they keep getting money back from this lottery and for each time it gets thrown out. Um so the half the pot gets thrown back and so that that's kind of a socialism thing, but the thing is is that they're all getting supported by each other um when they put money into this thing. And of course probably forever, probably wouldn't work. But this is kind of the same thing our governments are doing with state lotteries because what they're doing is you're putting money into the lottery. People are winning big, but they're not really profiting from it. They're taking the money that they profit from it and they put it back to buying stuff for schools and doing things like that. And it's the only way they can really get taxes out of people without telling them that we're going to tax you, you know. They're taxing you in a different way. However, problems with lotteries is that the people that really know about these things, it's a tax on the poor because the poor is the, the people that really want to win big. They're going to throw money that they could also they could otherwise put in a four hundred one k. Instead of putting in a four hundred one k, they put it in a lottery where they're never going to win, and the four hundred one k would actually pay out better over time if you start early. Um, you know, even if you put in $10 a day for the rest of your life, by the time you hit retirement, you would probably have two, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 in that 401k and being able to live off of that better and then maybe have a side job um, and being able to carry on 10, 20 years into the future. Um, that would be a better idea than throwing money at a lottery that's not going to win anybody, even you, uh, any amount of money. Uh, money that I have is going to a 401k. I should have done it earlier myself, um, but I did. I wasn't really employed when I was younger, and um, I've been. I'm not a very good example because I've been a um, a victim of circumstance for many years. I just didn't even know what a victim circumstance was. Um, one of the attributes of a psychopath is um, a parasitic lifestyle. If you've got any people around you who are like um, already around you because you give them money, then that's a parasitic lifestyle. You might actually have a psychopath hanging out with you and you wouldn't even know it. Um, and that's, they don't see any point in like actually learning um, how to do things. Um, they're more interested in themselves. And, but they, they will pander to you if they think that you'll give them money and then they'll go and, I mean, the thing is, is that they'll just keep doing it. And when you stop doing it, they'll find somebody else that will do it for them. They'll find somebody to, to, to befriend um, so that they can suck money out of them. And um, it goes on, the higher you go in, in, in the hierarchy and a rank of a company, 
the more you come in contact with these people and they don't have any concern for you. Um, if you ever saw the movie Devil Wears Prada, that's basically a psychopath. Um, if you've ever seen House of Cards, uh, the guy that Kevin Spacey plays is a psychopath. And it's probably questionable that Kevin Spacey himself is probably a sociopath, knowing what we know now about his, um, his sex life. Um, it's the, the further you get up in hierarchy, um, there are some people in hierarchy that have character that are actually good people. There are people there that are just, you know, they're stepping on people to get there. And, um, you come in contact and the, the politics increases as you go up. It's probably the reason why, um, the story of Jesus, whether you want to believe it or not, um, Jesus started at the very bottom, that God came in at the very bottom. This is because God knows that there's like all these, all these, um, all these politics and things that's going to prevent anybody coming through to have any difference of opinion or anything. And, uh, if you rise up a king, um, it, doesn't work and that's what the whole old testament was you know maybe god was just proving to everyone that no matter all the ways that people would have an opinion of how to do things he did all these different ways and it never amounted to much and so he's just saying that the only way you can fix things is to change the culture and so that's the reason why you get guys like muhammad gandhi and you know that just start a philosophy and a philosophy can change the way a whole organization of people work um so and it's great that the youtube exists but it seems like people spend more of their time blaming other people than actually coming up with ideas and sharing them um you can you can get a lot of people you can get a lot of viewership a big viewership if you um spend most of your time talking gossiping and um and then people agree with you and then they're on your side and then they just kind of like they're there to piss on other people and make them feel good about themselves and that's not really productive because when the show's over with you have this false sense of accomplishment that doesn't make you any better than the people that you've pissed on and so it's really so anyhow, um, but the thing was with that lottery is it's probably what the state's been using and, and it's how they get the money out of the people. Um, it's how they tax them, but it really is a tax on the poor and it's not, it's not good for that reason, um, that the poor are the ones that are going to be putting the money into it. And so anyhow, um, and if you need, I'm probably going to do a different video where I show people how to program any kind of gambling game. Um, it's a it's a computer science 101 problem. If uh, if you learn how to program, it's probably best that they teach you about random number generators firsthand, because once you learn that, then you probably will lose interest in gambling altogether because. Um, it's very easy to make a gambling program. It's like two or three lines of code. It's a random number generator. It's a seeding value, a random number generator, and a, uh, a conditional in a, in a flow control, an if statement. The conditional is, a, is an inequality, so less than, greater than. So I could specify a range of, of um, random of numbers um, that would result from the random number generator and I could say they would win when they are in the sliver of range and when they're outside of that they lose and I could guarantee that my that my um, profit for it was like 99% of the stuff I could make I could say I could create a margin of what the pot was and then the rest would be my profit and I could say I'll have, I'll get 70% of the profit, 20% will actually be the pot, and, um, uh, and then, like, a little sliver that somebody actually wins, 
and might win the pot, but it would go into the pot, but it also goes into my profit. And so I make 70% of everybody that's throwing at money at this lottery. They could do things like that. And, um, and it's very simple. It's, it's an ethical question more than it is a, and there's no way that you're ever going to be able to predict what the, um, how to control the luck. It's not going to be controllable because of how random number generators produce numbers that's equi probable. So, um, but I'll, in a later thing, I'll probably do a programming example just to show you that on various languages, I'll try it on JavaScript, I'll probably try it on PHP, I'll probably try it in C, and just show you in all these different languages that it's the same effect. You will never have, um, you will never win anything. You'll have greater chance, probability and statistics uh, talks about the chance that things are going to happen to you. Um, there, there are statistics that say you have, you're more likely to be struck by lightning 23 times than to win the lottery. You know, it's, it's stuff like that, you know, and so it's, you're not going to win it. And I'm even getting a feeling that the, my existence in the world that I'm in is really not even real itself. And I'm starting to see patterns in the world that lead me to think that this is not, that I'm not in the world I was born in. And so I don't get the feeling that anything I ever do will ever amount to anything. Um, videos, people watching this video, people going to my website, um, it's possible that this is all um, not going to amount to th something, but maybe it will. And so I, it it's, uh, offers a certain novelty for me to put these ideas out. Um, I had an idea for the for the Oculus Quest, um, the idea was that um, since they're going to make it so that, and that it's possibly already here, um, using artificial intelligence to recognize the um, the form and um, how the hands are or, uh, oriented, couldn't this be something useful to somebody who is uh, hearing impaired? They could actually um, do use sign language. They could work with sign language in front of the headset, and the headset would recognize all the various sorts of hand signals they're making. And actually, I mean, the the sign language, they, it could recognize the sign language, and turn it into either voice commands or or I mean, or into talk in a chat system. So you could use the VR and actually it would. It would be actually be easier for them to use VR to some extent um, than it would be if they were using an iPad or something. They could sign. They could sign to each other in VR. They could sign to convert it into speech or to to text, and it would be easier than actually using a keyboard. Um, it's really hard to to type um, in inside of a VR headset, the only thing you could really rely upon is actually having voice controlled, um, uh, voice recognition, and then turning that into text would be the way that that would be done. The thing that I've noticed on the Oculus Go, which was a major problem I had with it, is it has no copy and paste. It has no cut, copy, and paste. It's like um, people, it's like Mark Zuckerberg takes stupid vitamins. Um, he or takes stupid pills. Um, I don't understand the thinking for this, but um, it just prevents it from actually being a social platform if you don't have cut, copy, and paste. Um, he might see it as um, a potential risk for lose for um, um, that people might use it to copy other people's text. There's probably some reason for it. Maybe it's just not enough space. I don't see why it's not, you know, why there is no cut, copy, and paste. It's, it's a no-brainer. If you're going to do social networking, you're going to want that. What's the reason? And it dawned on me whenever I was doing it, uh, whenever I was thinking about it, um, there, was a, there was an app called um, 
called Air VR that permits you to use an Oculus Go headset um, with some software uh, via Wi-Fi you can connect to your PC and have it send uh, video streams over to the Oculus Go so that you could essentially use a Go to um, in, in place of a Rift. And I was thinking, okay, Oculus did this purposefully. They got rid of the cut, copy, and paste function inside the Oculus, Oculus Go so that people couldn't copy the special code from the website of, of the Air VR website to um, unlock the, the download from the Oculus Store because there was a way to paste it in to the Oculus Store inside the headset and they removed all of that because they don't want competition from Air VR. They didn't want people to be able to use um, an Oculus Go in place of a Rift. And that was probably the reason. And it, you know, it makes me think that um, I, I can understand now why they would do that, but people need to know that uh, they make decisions like this um, in their own interest. They don't care about the consumers at all. Um, they're, care they're, they're in it for themselves. And this is the reason why I'm against the idea of incorporation because it makes um, companies see the, the creditors as being more important than God. Um, and, you know, if you see a creditor as being more important than your consumers, by transitivity, you're saying that your creditors are more important than God. Your creditors, the creditors are the God of the corporation. And that's why we, I mean, if you're religious and you've got a corporation, you're incorporated, then you have to fathom the idea that your creditors are your gods. Um, or if you're the creditor, you are the god of that corporation. That corporation, the people that are working it, are going to be sitting there determining whether or not they are worshiping you or they're worshiping God when they're working for you. And um, there are people saying, well, this has always been the way. Uh, conservatives would say, fiscal conservatives. We have the religious conservatives, fiscal conservatives, and they're locked like this whenever even the religious conservatives don't even have, um, God would even do this, you know, bind with fiscal conservatives, ones who might actually be worshiping money more than actually treating people better. And um, this is the reason why I'm kind of a socialist, is that I'm more into treating people better. Um, I'm not talking about the one, the socialistic idea of stealing money from people, but the idea of supporting everybody, um, having basic um, necessities, things needed for life and civility, uh, for a civilization to exist. Um, having that stuff in place so that people can like actually um, be, um, you know, not really have to have a job, just be. And if you can't just be, then um, there is a problem you're going to suffer and everybody else is going to suffer as a result because how it, how it happens in our government is that the poor, when they get sick, they go into our hospitals, the hospitals have to treat them, but who gets, who pays for the bill is everybody does. And why would they get sick? consistently sick and why would we pay a lot to that through Medicare and all that um, it's because it's because we are not treating people we're not keeping track of people's health care records the PIDS thing I was talking about so we're not keeping track of people's health care records at the clinics and when somebody gets sick like a homeless person uh, we don't know his health history so we have a chance to like actually make him sicker, and as a result, we're going to be paying more money into um, fixing him, okay? And that's more money that's going to be coming out of your pocket. And how you fix that problem is, you know, by being concerned about health care. Um, so 
Uh, anyhow, I need to stop this. But uh, the thing is, is that it's all related, and it's all, um, it's all sorts of things that need to get fixed, and um, it needs to be, it needs to be policy put in place using software, using computers, because um, the thing about computers is they have a tendency to be correct more times than, than not, and humans have a tendency to fail. In fact, uh, I believe God created us to have the capacity to fail. It's impossible for anybody not to sin um, by the definition of what God sets or, you know, the Christian God sets is um, there's no way that um, anybody could, like, really succeed. Um, not sinning is like a joke. Um, that means that we'd have to be ultimately aware of everything around us at all times. And it's impossible. So the way I like to think of it is, is that I'm designed to sin. It says in the Christian faith that we're designed to praise, but the reality is that we're designed to sin. We're designed, um, we are designed to have the capacity to do great things, but we also do bad things. And um, when, and I believe to some degree the reason why we have a Christian religion in the first place is to point out that all other religions are man-made and they they have a tendency to make us go into wars and um, the, when the Christian religion is practiced correctly um, it it prevents wars but um, all religions even Christian religion has the capacity if people are ignorant of it or not really understanding the attributes of what it means to be that then they will get abused by it by somebody who will take it into control and use their ignorance against them you know so it's ignorance that is the problem it isn't religion it isn't uh the government it's ignorance it's it's darkness it's not knowing um it's not having transparency it's not following it's not following um it's not being concerned about other people um if you're not concerned about other people and even in the smallest point um then it's questionable whether the world will ever be perfect um and or even at perfect at any kind of level it the only way it possibly could be perfect um, is if it was controlled and it would, and I'm starting to realize that it probably is controlled and um, you know so there's no there's it isn't a mechanism it isn't what atheists want to believe um, that it's that it's all just a machine it isn't a machine because there's no way this thing could run the way it's running um, if it was um, all functional it's not um, there's there's entities at work in the world that are controlling everything and um, it's either one person or it's two people it might be multiple people um, it's not people as such it is beings and we're in it and this is just a test um, you think that this is all we're here for a limited amount of time and that limitation was set because if you have, if you were here for, uh, um, if you were here for a thousand years, um, people would die off, and you would there would be a certain a certain amount of apathy. You would not uh, apathy is not empathy. Apathy means you just um, you don't you, get, you become less concerned, and and people die off, and then it, you just come used to the idea that. Um, that death is happening and you don't you're not really concerned about anything and and you you do, unemotional you're that's apathy that you have no emotion and um, if you were given a longer life cycle um, that would be the effect because you wouldn't even be able to remember your father um, you there would be so much time that have passed 
that you wouldn't even remember anybody that you loved. And so you'll be kind of like a stone pillar. And, um, you know, having relate, you know, if you just have to look at uh, fiction, vampire fiction, to understand that um, vampires, um, to have um, a have a lifetime even if you weren't sucking the blood off of people if you were if you had no capacity to like um if you were not mortal if you were immortal um you would actually you would last actually lose interest in people you would not be able to have any concern for civilization you would become a psychopath over time and that's the reason why we have limited lives is to make um, civilization more important. The reason why we have amygdalas is to make make community more important than our own lives. And so uh, there's reason for that. Or, you know, in the Bible, all the Bibles, all this stuff, you would come to realize that if you were to write, actually think about it long enough. But, you know, it's only philosophers, people like me, that, like, actually think about it, it seems everybody else is more concerned with their their average life what they're doing and uh maybe watch a lot of history channel and stuff but does anybody ever think about things like this so and i'll just keep doing this uh video um i used to feel shameful about things that i send at um i I feel like if I'm still doing some good in the world, um, no matter what it is that I'm doing, if it's not hurting someone, it's not a problem. And I think it's more a problem whenever people are pointing a finger at other people as being the problem. That is why we have problems. And it's probably the reason why there are religions in place is to try to control that, control the, the, um, extreme of righteousness, um, being overly righteous, um, because we have limited senses. We don't have the capacity to be completely aware of our surroundings. And we're that way probably for a reason so that we can have choice, so that we can sin, so that we can do good things and do bad things. Um, you know, hopefully it's more good than we do bad. Um, I can't really know if what I've done has been uh, really more bad than good, but um, I feel like the more I can I can share with in videos, and I can create websites like Rockne Amadeus that might kind of relieve stress because people can watch a music video, watch a bunch of music videos, and be able to get some relief from the pressures, be distracted by something that might be that's not like television it's not going to be like sitting there telling them you know that they're terrorists in the world and things like that you don't need those things you don't need to know the news i don't i don't i'm not not aware of the news i'm not aware of the people that have died and it actually is more relieving um i have work i do things uh, i might watch some stuff on youtube um there are certain things that i care about in the, in the world but the news is not one of them because news just doesn't interest me that much. But if you want the news to be correct, if you think that the, there's lies in the news, um, get a VR headset. Start get the get the photojournalist to start using VR 180. It's very hard to fake. It's very hard to lie with VR 180. Very very hard, and it would be very hard to for politicians to hide themselves from it because when you take a cell, cell phone camera, you're taking a, a limited post expanse of space. You can't see everything around you. With a VR camera, you can see everything. And uh, a politician can't hide from a VR camera. Um, they, If you're pointing it at them, no matter where they go, what they do, who they talk to, it's all seen. And so, and you feel like you're there and so people feel more connected and so it's there's less there's more um accountability and 
a, a politician like Trump would have a very, very hard time telling you things that he did not do. I mean, things that he did and said that he did not do. Um, because people would have these VRR videos on it. And um, you could also detect deep faking. I'm pretty sure you could detect deep faking much more easily with VR 180 than you can with uh, 2D video. So um, I think it's in our best interest to um, work to that, so.